This is the Six Man Show, an Orlando Magic podcast, with your hosts Luke Silvia and Jonathan Osborne, covering all things Magic basketball. By fans, for fans, go Magic! What's going on, Orlando Magic fans? You guys are back with the Six Man Show. It is November first, two thousand twenty-one. Your host, Jonathan Osborne. As always, I am joined by my co-host, Luke Sylvia. Luke, what's going on, man? How you doing? I'm cold. I'm cold. The weather season, bro. is here in Omaha, beautiful Omaha, Nebraska. I was out just shooting on this random, like, Papa shot thing um, here in Nebraska today at a pumpkin patch. Uh, Lauren has her, you know, their dance studio that she has. They, they did a performance out there for like 20 or 30 minutes, a few d- dances and stuff. Took Harper out there and, uh, yeah, found the basketball hoop and, uh, was shooting with the cornfields behind me. It was the most like stereotypical Nebraska scene I've ever experienced so far. Yeah. Tonight, I uh, hope you guys all had a fun, safe, happy Halloween. This was, uh, my oldest daughter's first official Halloween the first year or first uh, Halloween, she was sick. Last year, obviously with COVID, nobody really you know did the trick or treating thing. So this was our first foray into trick or treating with a, an almost three year old. And I, I get it. Like you know, obviously haven't really been excited about Halloween since I was twelve, thirteen years old trick or treating. But now that you get to eat your kids' candy, mm-hmm. it's like all right, this this kind of everything you know really makes sense. So um, just a couple of housekeeping things, guys, before we get into the magic. As a lot of you know, we started a Patreon a few weeks back. You can find us at patreon.com slash the six man show. We've got three tiers. If you guys want to support the show, really, really help us out there. Um, And then if you guys aren't following us on social media, you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at six man show. So make sure that you guys go and show us uh, a follow. We just hit 3,000 followers on Twitter. Really excited about that. Really appreciate you guys. So yeah, follow us on socials. Luke, the weekly state of the magic Folks, your Orlando Magic went 0-4 this week with a blowout 109-90 to loss to the Miami Heat, a 120-111 to loss at home to the Hornets on Wednesday, a last-second loss 110-109 to to the Toronto Raptors on Friday, and then finished the week Saturday with a 110-103 to loss to the Pistons. Luke, the Magic are now 1-6. They are tied with Indiana and New Orleans for the worst record in the league. Is that good? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Um, It doesn't feel good, but in terms of, I guess, if we are tanking this season, which I guess we can talk about a little bit later in terms of what really is the goal this season. Yeah. But, I mean, you're tied with two other teams. We were right there last year with, you know, tied for the best odds to win the lottery. We ended up fifth. So, as we now know, all of that is random. I don't Mm -hmm. think we should really be putting a ton of weight into that. And here's my thing. I thought about this last night. All the people right now that are rooting for you know losses or, or excuse me, rooting for wins earlier in the season, you cannot then switch up and towards the end of the year start rooting for losses because that game that you won the third game of the year against right. the Knicks counts just the same as game 82 does. So if you're not like rooting for 0 and 82, I don't want to hear any crap towards the end of the season when then you're hoping for you know higher lottery odds and the rest of us are getting excited about Cole Anthony game winners and stuff like that. So, yeah, not great, Luke. Um, it was a rough week. You and I both said they were going to go 1-3. and three. We had picked different games. They go 0-4. Oh mm-hmm. Definitely two games in particular that we're going to talk about that the Magic could have won and did not. Um, but let's go ahead and uh, we'll talk about the, the game Monday in Miami against the Heat. All right, Luke, game one of the week, Monday at the Miami Heat, our in-state rivals. I mean, I guess you can call it a rivalry, although the last 10 years or so, they've been kicking the crap out of us. However, for us, this was the second night of a back-to-back after the win, bing bong, bong. over the next Sunday night. Uh, Gary Harris made his season debut. He had been out of the lineup, but he made his season debut. Jamal Mosley um, chose to stick with the starting lineup. That has really uh, been very successful so far to start the season. Cole Anthony, Jalen Suggs, Franz Wagner, Wendell Carter Jr., Mo Bamba. Miami Heat shoot 54% in the first quarter. Magic just 27% from the floor, commit five first quarter turnovers. The Heat were up 27 to 15 after one. The Magic do have a much better second quarter, played Miami almost even, still trailed 13 at the half. 
And then that second half, any time the Magic tried to get anything going offensively, it just seemed like Jimmy Butler would answer. Orlando could not stop him as he scored 36 points on 15 of 21 shooting from the floor. He did play the entire third quarter. So Magic coming off the second night of a back-to-back. Spolstra saw this, saw that our guys were gassed. Having the, the Heat just run and run and run the entire night. Had Jimmy Butler in that third quarter, they felt like if they held on to the win through three quarters, that the Magic were really just going to fold in the fourth. That's basically what happened. Yep. And the Magic lose 107-99 to 99. really quickly, just looking at the box score. Again, Jimmy Butler, 36 points, 71% from the floor. Bam Adebayo, 16 points, 13 rebounds. Markeith Morris off the bench, 16 points, 7 of 11 from the floor. For the Magic, Franz Wagner, another decent night shooting the ball. 15.6 of 13 from the floor. Cole Anthony right there with him. 12 points, uh, 5 of 13 from the floor. Added 9 rebounds, 5 assists. Jalen Suggs, this was one of his better games uh, so far, especially shooting the ball from deep. 15 points, 4 of 8 from the 3-point line, 4 rebounds. And then RJ Hampton, 12 points, 4 of 8 from the floor, 2 of 3 from the 3-point line. So, Luke, coming off you know, second night of a back-to-back, you have the big emotional win, New York City, Madison Square Garden. Um, were you expecting you know, what we saw out of the Magic against the Heat? And I don't think anybody expected Jimmy Butler to shoot 71% from the floor, but you know, kind of is what it is. Yeah, I mean, and you knew it early, right? I mean, the writing was on the wall. The Heat, you know, like you said, however, five first quarter turnovers, whatever it was, you go down 12. I mean, you go down 12 at Miami. You know, Miami at that point, I mean, you're coming off of an emotional back-to-back. You beat, you know, the Knicks, like you said, at MSG. The Heat at that point had had a, you know, a day's worth of rest. They didn't play on Sunday. So you come in, you're down 27 to 15, man. At that point, you'd think, you know, you just need to, to, to slow down, calm down, maybe limit your turnovers as we, you know, have been kind of preaching about this team. You look at it, Jonathan. I mean, I, I've made this point before. I think I made it last week. If, if you are not winning the turnover battle, there is a great chance if you are a young team like Orlando, you lost that game. Orlando, looking at it again, you know, 18 turnovers to Miami's 11. Suggs, while he had a great game, had the most turnovers with five. Um, and, and that was one thing I did want to kind of, you know, commend Franz on for that game. He has four assists that game and zero turnovers. Um, so just kind of continuing to be, you know, the, the reason that Orlando drafted him, right? Like Franz for that game, especially showed out in terms of, you know, his, his high, you know, offensive IQ, um, his intangibles, those are the things that Orlando really drafted him for. So good on him. No turnovers that night. Um, Jalen did shoot the ball very encouragingly. I mean, four for eight from three, like you said, five of 12 from the field. I'm, you know, I'm not mad at that at all. Um, yeah, man. I mean, that, that's. Like I said, you're shooting yourselves in the foot going down 12 into the first quarter. Kind of we're out of the game from that point on. Moving on, uh, game two Wednesday, home versus the Hornets. Uh, starting lineup, Cole, Suggs, Franz, Wendell, Mo Bamba. Jamal Mosey really just keeping with that lineup. Obviously, very exciting matchup. LaMelo Ball coming to town. Um, one of the most exciting young players in the league. Anytime that he is in the building, um, going to be some good energy. And there was. Uh, despite being out rebounded 22 to 15, and Charlotte having a 14 to six free throw advantage in the first half, the Magic were lucky enough to only trail by three. Magic did have a strong offensive third quarter. They shot 54 percent to take a two point lead into the fourth quarter. However, Orlando commits seven live ball fourth quarter turnovers, which led to nine Charlotte points off turnovers, and the Magic end up losing that game by nine, 120 to 111. So the Magic again after that. Bad loss, uh, you know, Monday against the Heat. We're looking to bounce back from that on Wednesday. And they played well enough through the first three quarters of this game, um, you know, to end up winning the game. But again, those fourth quarter turnovers, again, end up seven live ball turnovers it was, ended up in a nine points off turnovers. When you look and you see that Charlotte ended up winning the game by nine, it's really easy to make, um, you know, the, the argument that those turnovers in the fourth quarter really were the story. Uh, looking at the box score, Wendell Carter, 20 points, 10 rebounds, 8 of 15 from the floor. Cole Anthony getting it going again in this one, 24 points, 5 rebounds, 6 assists. He shot 11 of 20 from the floor. And then Terrence Ross, who did not have a good game Monday night against the Heat, uh, bounced back with an 18-point game, uh, 4 of 8 from the floor. 
uh, seven, uh, excuse me, four of eight from the three point line, seven of fifteen from the floor. Looking over uh, at Charlotte, it was all Gordon Hayward, Miles Bridges, and then in the second half, especially Jalen McDaniels. Uh, Jalen McDaniels, 16 points, 4 of 5 from the three-point line. Uh, Miles Bridges, 31 points, 5 of 10 from the three-point line. And then Gordon Hayward, 24 points, 2 of 3 from the three-point line. He shot 69% from the floor in this game. And then Miles Plumley, 14 points, 10 rebounds, 75% uh, from the floor. The Hornets shoot 51% for the game. The Magic shoot 48%. Like I said, you look at the box score, Luke, these teams really played each other pretty evenly. Yeah. Um, for me, it just all came down to that fourth quarter and the turnovers, and that's kind of a, a theme that we're seeing with this team, is when they lose, it, you can almost always point to two things, yeah. bench play and turnovers, and this was just kind of another uh, chapter of that story. Yeah, not great. Um, get out rebounded by seven. I mean, the the, like you said, the turnovers really are the whole story there. Um, played well, you know, throughout the game. The uh, Hornets team that's pretty good. Miles Bridges, by the way, um, uh, he's got to be early running for MIP at this point. I mean, he averaged like 12 or 13 a game last year. Could be wrong. Um, but right now he's averaging, I think, like 25 and a half. So, which is insane for a guy to make that jump. Obviously, maybe he comes back down to earth and averages 20, or maybe he's just... Julius Randle from last year, where he takes a jump out of nowhere. Um, I mean, he he really looked impressive. Like, just looked like he couldn't be stopped. And like you said, you know, you touched on the guys that, that did play well. Cole Anthony, man, we'll talk about him a little bit more later, but just continues to impress me. Yeah, uh, it was like Monday, Wednesday, couldn't stop Jimmy, and then you couldn't stop uh, Miles Bridges. Those guys were really just, it really felt like those guys were the difference in those uh, respective games. Uh, game three of the week. At Toronto on Friday night, it was the first matchup of Scotty Barnes versus Jalen Suggs. It's been a hot topic, uh, you know, on the Orlando Magic subreddit and, and Magic Twitter and uh, you know Raptors Twitters and you know um, you know Magic fans and Toronto fans just kind of going back to back. So it was really highlighted, you know, going into the game. Uh, again, same starting lineup. Uh, we did have good starts from Bamba and Suggs. Magic were down just three after one. And then big second quarters from Wendell Carter Jr. and Cole Anthony. Uh, however, with a 19-point first half from Scotty Barnes, the Magic were down three at the half, although we did hold Scotty Barnes uh, just to two points in the second half. Uh, Magic were up one going into the third, and then Toronto uses an 11-0 run early in the fourth quarter to take a 10-point lead. And then for most of the fourth quarter, Luke, each time the Magic would get close, Van Vliet would hit a play, whether it was you know making a, a play for somebody else, knocking down a shot, getting to the free throw line, really just keeping the Magic at arm's length the best that he could. He ends up hitting a three with 204 left in the game to put the Raptors up 12. Uh, game fell over at that point, if I'm if I'm being totally honest. Orlando closes the game on an 11 to zero run, and look, this is what I want to talk about here. Uh, down four, Magic are down four with 42 seconds left. Ananobi looks like he has a free run to the rim. Jalen Suggs helps from the weak side, meets OG Ananobi at the rim, blocks the dunk attempt, and then the other way, Cole finds Franz Wagner for a quarter three to cut the lead to one. Ananobi, Raptors come the other way. He misses a three with 13 seconds left. Mo Bamba rebound. Jalen Suggs is driving, uh, you know, towards the rim. He doesn't really, we'll talk about this. This is what I want to br uh, break down. Mosley calls a timeout with 5.8 seconds left. Draws up a play. It looks like it was going to be like a Cole Franz Wagner high pick and roll, um, which I really love the idea of that. Cole is just playing so well, and uh, Franz is able to make plays off the dribble and is just such a great decision maker. But Gary Trent pokes the ball loose. Cole is able to kind of regather that. He gets a, a good look at half court um, attempt at the buzzer. Misses. Magic lose 110 to 109. So, Luke, that last play in particular, OG misses. Mo Bamba gets the rebound. Jalen yeah. Suggs is driving. Um, a lot of people were upset that Mosley called a timeout there with 5.8 seconds left. What was your take on that play? Um, it's tough, man. I, I really do think this is a, um, you know, I, I really think it's tough. I don't think it's necessarily as black and white in terms of what what should have been done by by Mosley in the situation. It stinks. Um, I think it is, though, you know, Mosley and kind of just the growing pains of being a first-year coach, man. I mean, the, everything is happening so quick. He's having to make, you know, split decisions. 
it all comes with time. I think Mosley will, you know, learn from it and and continue to, you know, decide when when's the best time for his timeouts and when's not. Because he's had some some questionable times where he, you know, has used timeouts or hasn't rotations, things like that. Man, he's just he's learning, and uh, I mean, it, we're 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 learning together. I think is what we're seeing. Um, I mean, I I really I really don't know. Yeah, for me, I I really didn't find it as egregious as a lot of other people did. Um, you know, looking at that play, you know, you can clearly see guys backpedaling. Um, some people are claiming that Jalen had like an open run to the rim, and I just didn't really see it that way. I thought, you know, he was probably going to have to try to finish over, you know, at least two or even three guys there. Um, where it looked like he really broke loose was after the refs blew the whistle for the timeout. And then you just see everybody like kind of stop, mm-hmm. like it's like you're you're playing pickup. If somebody calls timeout and one person doesn't hear and you know goes and scores, like no 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 no, like everybody's obviously stopped. And it was really the same thing there. And this to me comes down to like coaching philosophy. Like some guys, they want to call a timeout, they want to get a play in. Other coaches, you know, they don't want to let the defense get set. They just want you to try to put your head down and get to the rim and, and get fouled. Um, you know, Jalen, in terms of like the advanced metrics, is actually doing pretty well in terms of um, you know drawing fouls yeah. early on. Um, so I wouldn't have been obviously I wouldn't have been mad at Jalen trying to get the rim there, win or lose. But uh, yeah, I think it just comes down to you know Gary Trent makes a great play. He had made a great play on Jalen a few minutes earlier. Um, you know, as the Magic are trying to make a run and poke the ball away from him, and we were texting, we're like, well, we, you definitely can't have that happen. And then a few yeah. minutes later, Gary Trent does the same thing to Cole. So I think right now Gary Trent is like top ten in the league in deflection. So if there's anybody that's going to be able to make that kind of play, it's going to be Gary Trent. Unfortunately, we just happen to be on the wrong end of it, and you end up losing that game. But it was really exciting seeing the team make that run. Um, obviously, Jalen with the the four point play, he gets fouled on a deep three. Um, you know, a couple of series down, Franz Wagner hits the corner three. Um, the bench is going absolutely crazy. Jalen makes the block on OG, which led to the the Wagner three. And then, you know, with like 10 seconds left, you got the ball coming down the other way. It's a one-point game, and you have a chance to win the game. So I don't want to say this was like a moral victory, but almost never you're going to see a team down 12 yeah. with a little bit more than two minutes left. 99 out of 100 times that game is just completely over. So, uh, But we can run through the box score here. There are a lot of guys that played well in this game, no surprise. Wendell Carter Jr., 17 points, 12 rebounds, 66% from the floor. Mo Bamba, 14 points, 18 rebounds in this one for Mo. Cole Anthony, another great game this week, 24 points, 5 rebounds, 5 assists. Uh, he shot 53% from the floor, 5 of 6 from 3 on the night. Uh, Jalen Suggs, probably his best all t- altogether game um, in a Magic uniform so far. 21 points, 42% from the floor, but was 4 of 8 from 3. 5 of 5 from the free throw line, 2 rebounds, 4 assists, 1 block. Did have 3 turnovers, uh, you know, obviously, which is always going to come back to bite you. And then the Toronto Raptors, obviously, Scotty Barnes, uh, 21 points, 9 of 14 from the floor, was just unstoppable in that first half. Fred Van Vliet. 19 points, 7 of 16 from the floor. Uh, a lot of these points for him you know, came in the fourth quarter again. He was just making play after play after play. Luke, what did you think of kind of like the Scotty Barnes versus Jalen? Jalen's at the line late in the game. Raptors fans are, are chanting Scotty's better. Like Raptors fans are, are very, very sensitive about this, the fact that the Magic were excited to get Jalen Suggs over Scotty Barnes. Scotty Barnes has been the better player so far. But what what's your take on that whole uh whole situation? Um, I mean, honestly, I thought because we had talked about it and essentially said like the Magic cannot lose this game at the hands of Scotty Barnes having an incredible game, like that just it it can't happen. But I think we we didn't factor in is that if Jalen has just as good of a game, we can live with it, and that's what happened. I mean, but but I mean, don't get me wrong. First half, it looked like it was going to be just the Scotty show. I mean, what he scores, what, the first seven points or something like that? Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think he had uh, a three and, and two two you know two two point buckets. So um, started out the game really hot, like you said, held him to two, I think, second half points there. Um, I thought that we were just in for it. I thought we'd, I said, this is it. Scotty Barnes is about to drop, you know, 30 and 10. 
and it's going to be a nightmare. Thankfully, uh, Jalen Suggs was able to kind of be just steady throughout the game in terms of his scoring and whatnot. 21 points, like you said, four assists, two rebounds. Um, it's it's not, you know, everything, but, you know, he had a plus seven, plus minus. Um, pretty good there. While, you know, if you look at the plus minus for Scotty as a team that won, Scotty actually had a minus 13 plus minus, the lowest on the team. So I think that was probably the second half that kind of did that to Scotty um, in terms of plus minus. But, you know, it's not a stat that I like to rely on a lot. But, it, you know, it does help when the game is very close. Two players supposed to be kind of contributing about the same amount there. Um, I really think that, I, I mean, I was very relieved to see that Jalen was able to kind of keep that up. Playing seven minutes less than Scotty, by the way, and matching his point total. I was very impressed with Suggs versus Scotty that night. The funny thing to me is, you know, obviously we feel a certain type of way about Raptors fans chanting Scotty's better. Yeah. Like Jalen Suggs never said anything negatively about Toronto. You guys, again, we talked about this on our episode of Shoot the Shot last week, but you guys took the guy that you wanted at four. We didn't necessarily need another forward. You know, we saw guys like Chuma Okiki and Jonathan Isaac as kind of the cornerstones at the three and the four of this team. So you throw Scotty Barnes in there, and you just kind of have another forward. We've had forward log jams in the past. We didn't want another one. We knew that we needed the dynamic guard. We got that. We knew that as soon as um, Toronto took Scotty Barnes, that Jalen Suggs was there for the taking with the Magic, and it just made too much sense. So obviously we were really excited. Now when you throw shade at the Raptors fans for acting like idiots and, and chanting you know, at this 20-year-old kid who did nothing wrong, then they want to say, oh, well, did you see what Magic fans did? Oh, my God, they were so happy at the draft. <laughs> yeah, because we got the guy that we wanted. You got the guy that you wanted. That's the right. end of it. Stop being so sensitive. Have your mommy kiss your boo-boos on the inside mm -hmm. and leave our guy alone. All yeah. right? You ever seen Joe Dirt? Yes. Christopher Walken, he, he's sitting in, he's looking at the fire exit, and he says, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're talking to my guy all wrong. It's the wrong tone. <laughs> you do it again, I'm going to stab you in the face with a soldering iron. Tell me, does your mother sew? Tell her to sew that. <laughs> All right? That's my Christopher Walken. That, that was great. horrible. No, that was but, great. That was great. Yeah, I, I, just, really I just, I really like these young guys, and any type of disrespect from this country, another country internationally, no international respect uh, that night for uh, for Jalen Suggs, unfortunately. Well, so. and I want to, you know, real quick, Jonathan, before we get into this Pistons game, the game that oh Mo my God, do we have to? I mean, not really, but uh, the uh, the Mo Bamba. I mean, if you if you look at his you know performance that night against Toronto, fourteen and eighteen. I, I said this to you before. Um, Mo seemingly comes down with a rebound too low. Sometimes it gets ripped from him. He you know might not. It, he's not securing as many rebounds as maybe as he as he could. Um, in some scenarios, it just seems like it's kind of turns into a fifty fifty ball sometimes. Mo that night had 18 rebounds. He's averaging nine on the year, which is good. But I truthfully think, and obviously WCJ and Cole actually are coming in and WCJ is leading the team by like 0.2 or 0.3 in rebounds over Mo. Mo could be a guy that averages 12 rebounds a game. I don't think that's hard to believe at all, given his you know length and frame and everything like that. Those are the type of rebounding nights that I expect he could have multiple times a year. And, and I was super impressed with his rebounding against Toronto. I'm hoping that that can continue and he can learn from that, um, continue to anticipate you know shots coming off the rim. I'm sure he works on that. But just being secure with the ball when you go up and grab it, maybe not bringing it down as low, right? I mean, you you get the ball, you pass it to your outlet, man, you're, you're going. I just want him to continue to get better at that. And I was very um, impressed by his rebounding you know, in that night. Also, another thing that I wanted to point out here, Jonathan, um, I'm going to go back to plus or minus because I think it does speak volumes again. Cole Anthony, highest plus minus on the team, plus 16. I mean, that tells the story right there. Um, 24, 5, and 5. Um, you know, only two turnovers on a team that's been struggling with turnovers. I mean, it, it, really not enough to be said about Cole and, and that performance that night. I mean, the, lo the loss definitely wasn't on him. He, he played his butt off that night. I mean, a lot of guys, you know, played heavy minutes in this game. You look at Mo Bamba, you know, like you said, obviously yeah. 18 rebounds. He plays 39 minutes. 
Um, Mosley like really tightened up the rotation in this game. Like we saw Robin Lopez only seven minutes, mm -hmm. RJ Hampton only five minutes, uh, almost six minutes. Mort Mort Wagner uh, eight minutes twenty nine seconds. So like they really sold out the last couple of minutes of that game, which perhaps contributed to the loss yeah. last night. Um, which we will talk about in a second, Luke. So let's go ahead and take a quick break from our friends at Manscaped, and then we'll talk uh, the disaster in Detroit last night. Guys, it is football season, baby, and you know what that means? It means we're going for two here with the sponsors of today's show, Manscaped. Blitzing through hairs has never been easier, and it's time you join the 2 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by using code 6 that's S-I-X-T-H at manscaped.com for 20% off plus free shipping. It's three and out the window with all other trimmers. Now go tame that Wildcat offense. The Performance Package 4.0 from Manscaped is the perfect package for your package and a key for a great grooming and hygiene routine to make sure the boys downstairs are smooth like Tom Brady in the fourth quarter. The brand new Lawnmower 4.0 is here to take your defense to the next level. This fourth generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accents thanks to their advanced skin safe technology. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code 6 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code 6 S I X T H. Stiff arm your pubes out of the playoffs this year with Manscaped. All right, game four, Detroit. So we're recording this again, uh, Halloween night, so Sunday night. So the Detroit game for us was last night, obviously Saturday night for you guys. This was the NBA debut for the number one overall pick this year's draft, Cade Cunningham. He's been out with an ankle injury uh, since, I believe, summer league or preseason. So uh, this was the first look for him um, you know, in an NBA regular season game. Again, same starting lineup, Luke. The, the story in this game starts here for me. The Magic were out-rebounded 35-21 to in yeah. the first half, but are able to hold Detroit to 34% shooting and force 11 first-half turnovers. They were down just one at the half. I tweeted this right before the half. It felt like this team should have been down 15-20, to but we were super lucky to be down uh, just one at the, at the half again. Coming off of a game where a lot of guys play heavy minutes, heartbreaking loss, second night of a back-to-back, this is a game that you circled on the calendar, or you should have, that this is a potential win. And if this team would have been down 15 to 20 points at the half, and we're like, all right, second night of a back-to-back, -back, it's the fifth not, fifth game in seven nights, they just don't have it tonight, I would have understood that, okay? But you find yourself down one, it's like, okay, we've got to do what we can to sell out and, and get this W. Magic were down three with eight minutes and 30 seconds to go into the third quarter. So Mo Wagner comes in for Wendell Carter Jr., who was absolutely gassed. Looking back at the film, he's like hobbling around. He's breathing heavy. He's doubled over, you know, in between dead balls, just trying to suck as much wind as he can. So we did not see Wendell Carter for the rest of the night, and we'll kind of get into that in a moment. But So that group, so the starters plus Mo Wagner, uh, they go on a quick run. Um, Orlando's then up seven with five minutes to go in the third quarter. At the 454 mark, up four at this point, Okiki and Harris come in for Mo Bamba, Cole Anthony. Then at the three minute and 34 second mark, Ross and Hampton sub in for Jalen and Franz Wagner. So now we've got RJ, Terrence Ross, Gary Harris, Chuma Okiki, and Mo Wagner in. So that group uh, really starting at the five minute mark, but kind of slowly bringing those bench guys in. Detroit closes the third on a 19 to six run. The Magic find themselves down nine, heading into the fourth quarter. With like six minutes to go, the lead balloons to 17. So uh, the Magic, they go on a little bit of a run. They're down 15 with four minutes, 34 seconds to go. And Mo Mosley uh, just subs in like the, the G-leaguers, like, like the third stringers uh, with Cole Anthony out there. And the Magic end up losing 110 to 103. So, Luke, I I'm going to go first here. I was very frustrated about this loss. Um, in the midst of that third quarter run, again, you're so lucky to be down one at half. At this point, the team is one in five. You're zero and three on the week so far, with some heartbreaking losses. You know, a blowout loss. Uh, it was close in that Charlotte game until you just turned the ball over nine or seven times in the fourth quarter. So for me, it's like 
this is one of these games where, yes, it's important for these guys, you know, to develop and get different guys in there. And yes, you do need to rest some of these guys to a certain extent. Um, but this whole run was with mainly bench guys in. So I, I'm not really buying into the fact that it was energy that uh, the guys just kind of ran out of energy and the tank was empty because it was all bench guys who have been playing, you know, 15 to 20 minutes a game. It's not like their starters playing 28 to 35 minutes a game. Mosley just lets, you know, th- them go on that run. And if you're looking to steal minutes in the first half because you're worried about guys being gassed, then we should have saw guys like, you know, Brass Dacus or, uh, you know, maybe Michael Mulder in that first half, especially as close as that game was when you should have been down by 20 points. I just thought, um, you know, all this talk about, you know, fighting and, 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 you know, playing with the right energy and everything like that, we did not see that um, in the third quarter. I know Mosley is a young coach. He's still figuring things out. But this is the kind of win, um, this is the kind of game that you need to win. On the road, second night of a back-to-back, fifth game in seven nights, you're only down one. You have a seven-point lead in the third quarter, and then you basically just crumple up the game and throw it in the garbage uh, by the last you know five-minute lineup that we saw in the third quarter. And then we just saw it the night before in Toronto. The guys were down 12 with two minutes left. They were able to come back. So then the next night we're looking at a 15-point game with four minutes left, and all of a sudden and you know there's other circumstances. We can't really look at this in a vacuum. But Mosley goes, ah, you know what? Game's over. And we basically just give up at that point. I'm done. I will I will let you say what you have to say here. I want you to once again that that lineup in the third quarter that Mosley puts in there. What tell tell our listeners again, what was that lineup again that gave up that huge run? RJ Hampton, Terrence Ross, Chuma Okiki, Gary Harris, Moritz Wagner. Yeah. I mean, and that 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 should irritate everybody, right? <laughs> I mean, Chuma played 14 minutes last night. Uh, and, and RJ plays 19 when he had played minimal the night before. I Like you said, maybe it had something to do with coming off of that game the night before and, you know, not wanting to run. For Chuma, this was the first game back off of the hip injury. We did right. not mention that, but yeah. so he was on some type of minutes restriction. I'm not as mad as that. No, 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 no. of course. Like, but I'm saying, like, RJ the night before didn't play as many minutes, right, for one reason or another. Yeah, comes he played in, five minutes. Yeah, he comes in this next night, obviously – fresh as can be and plays 19 minutes there's just I mean there's a reason he played five minutes the night before I'm not giving up on RJ Hampton by any means but there is a reason he played five minutes the night before and then there's no reason to keep the same guys in while they're just giving up this hugely the worst thing to me was not you know the the final minutes whatever that that you know what happens there the, the worst thing is absolutely that run that gives up at the end of the third quarter. You're in a game um, where you're at Little Caesars, right? You're there. Cade's making his debut. There's a lot of energy in the arena. The, the arena is going to feed off of that run at the end of the third quarter. You have got to put a stop to that run at the end of the third quarter or else that fourth quarter could have gotten out of hand for just the momentum that Detroit was carrying into the end of the game. Cade wasn't playing great, but I know that crowd was just on fire last night because of, you know, Cade's, you know, debut and everything. You you can't do that. That that I know earlier I gave Mosley the benefit of the doubt. He's a young coach figuring out his, you know, timeout scenarios and when he wants to do things and when rotations are. I hope he learned, right? I'm basically giving Mosley a pass on each of the the these certain scenarios. And and hoping that he makes that adjustment, um, you know, moving forward. There, I just I, I'm I'm so ready for Markel to be back and Ji to be back, so we can really get a good view of these rotations because some of these rotations are scary, Jonathan. Like that, the fact that those guys were in for that big of a collapse to end the third quarter when you had been playing decent throughout the rest of the game, it really was discouraging to see. And what what sucked to me was so we got to see you know Mo Wagner and Franz Wagner together in that third quarter, yeah. and they're you know hitting threes yeah. and we're building momentum again. You know we go on a run and we go up seven, um, and then yeah, you, like I hate to say this, but if you were going to intentionally tank, you're looking at the schedule, you're looking at the roster that Detroit has, and you say you know what, 
five, six months from now, when we're talking about lottery odds, this is probably a team that it would be good, you know, to have a worse record then. Like Detroit is probably going to be one of those teams that's competing for a top, you know, three, uh, you know, best three odds at the number one overall pick in the draft. So last year, you know, like we beat Detroit late in the season, right? Detroit ends up with the number one overall pick. So the Magic, like, if there was ever a time to do that, to me, that's what this looks like. This is a game, really, in that first half you had no business being in, and then you're up in the third quarter, and then the substitutions that you make just completely give up that lead, and then you're down nine heading into the fourth quarter. In five minutes, you go from being up seven to being down nine. And Mosley is a young coach. He's obviously he still has a lot to learn. He's still figuring things out with these lineups. And I'm sure there was part of him that felt like he needed to get some of these guys rest. But these guys are 20, 21, 23 years old. If you go to these guys Jonathan, and say, look, I what, know you guys are tired. What, what, I, we I, I, need this game. Yeah, and, and what I'm going to say to you, Jonathan, I, I believe I've told you this before. What is it that that my dad tells me? About, you know, I got to go to, I, I need to go to bed. I got, I got work in the morning or I got to do this. And I got, what, what, what do you think he says to me, Jonathan? It's okay. You're young. You're young. You're young. These guys are so young. We hear it all the time. They're the youngest in the NBA. These guys can play those minutes. You, I mean, a testament These guys to are competitors. Yeah. in a testament to that, look at Tibbs in New York. He runs his guys into the ground. Like yeah, I you know well, that's the that's the other end of the spectrum. That it you is. Don't want. It that's is. But if extreme. you can, it, but but still, that's a playoff team. That's a that's a good team who's young. They got a lot of run in them. They Tibbs will run Derrick Rose into the ground. He doesn't care. Derrick Rose for all he, he is, he and did do he, that. he did do that, right? He did so, unfortunately, so, and Joe Kim Noah. So. But but even now he's running D Rose. You know, at, at least last season running them well, behind him. They, he doesn't care. The Tibbs, at the end of the day, I mean, you look at a guy that just wants to win at any cost to a fault. He wants to win, and he's going to just play his guys minutes and minutes. These guys are 21, 22 years old, Jonathan. 20. Just play them. Just play them. They'll, you're not they'll making learn. me feel any better. I know. I know. And it, But it is the truth. Like, at the end of the day, you're young. Run. That's it. I, it just comes back. Like, I just keep coming back to the fact that you look at the schedule, mm-hmm. especially – like after Monday, like Minnesota is the last team for like a month that I feel like we have a really good chance of beating. Um, now I don't want to I don't want to sell this team too short because it does feel like you know on any given night they can beat any team. Like mm-hmm. obviously they are deeply flawed. They don't have a very you know they have basically no margin for error. But this team is capable of putting together a really good game for forty eight minutes and upsetting a good team. They just did it you know the other night against the Knicks. But again, you're down one at the half after getting like dominated on the boards. Second night of a back to back against a team that you legitimately have a chance to win. You're up seven with five minutes to go in the third quarter. You've got to sell out for that win. And that's the last thing that I'm going to say, Luke. Let's take a look at the box score. Franz Wagner, 19 points, 8 of 15 from the floor, 53% shooting. Mo Bamba, 10 points, only three rebounds. So obviously the team got dominated on the boards. Uh, but he was 4-5 or five from the floor. And then Cole Anthony, 15 points, 10 rebounds, another double-double for him. 6 of 11 from the floor, 30, uh, 3 of 4 from the f- three-point line. Cade uh, Cunningham, 2 points in 18, almost 19 minutes. 1 of 8 from the floor, 7 rebounds, 2 assists, and 2 turnovers. Not a great debut for him. Kelly Olynyk, and this is another thing, the first half, Kelly Olynyk, I believe, shot 1 of 6 from the floor. Mm-hmm. When guarded by Chuma Okiki or Franz Wagner, mm. the second half mostly guarded by Mo Bamba and Moritz Wagner, uh, shot five of six from the floor. He was really the difference um, yeah. in that second half for for the Pistons. Jeremy Grant, twenty two points, seven rebounds, five assists, sixteen for fourteen. Yeah, uh, excuse me, six for fourteen on the floor. Um, yeah, I <laughs> still am not over that Pistons. So the the loss, the silver lining here is a funny tweet. From a guy that I usually can't stand, and that's John Hollinger from the Athletic. He t- tweets out after the game, "The winner of the Cade Cunningham versus Jalen Sugg showdown is Franz Wagner." <laughs> so, yep. so, I, I, and it really is the truth, man. I mean, Cade was the third best rookie on the court last night. You know, 
So, uh, yeah. So, Franz, I mean, eight for 15, three of six from three, 19 points, three rebounds, two assists, uh, one turnover. I mean, and, 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 you know, Suggs didn't shoot well, but, but, but Suggs per usual was everywhere, right? Only two turnovers for Suggs last night and six assists. That was a highlight of the night for me. That was, he's, he is, fi- he's trying to actively fix that turnover problem. Like I said, poor he's, shooting. He's improving at finishing at the rim. Yeah, absolutely. But that, that's the thing, right? I mean, if, if you are not going to, and he's figuring it out, if, if you are not going to be able to contribute, you know, on with your points, right? You're not going to be able to put the ball in the basket. You better be able to uh, create some playmaking with your assists, right? And if you're going to do that, you need low turnovers. He did it. He did it. I at, at the the silver lining for me, you know, very truly, is that Jalen Suggs had that many assists and that low of amount of turnovers. It was it was a great night in in my in my book for Jalen Suggs. Despite people would be like, oh well, he shot three of thirteen. He's a rookie. He's gonna have those nights, man. He he's trying to figure it out. But but it, the shot's gonna fall eventually, right? If he is going to be a good shooter, the shot will fall eventually. I am much more concerned about his turnovers. And and last night he did incredibly well with his turnovers last night compared to his assists. So I I really think that uh, Cade Cunningham truly was the uh, third best rookie last night. Cade also I don't know if you saw Jonathan didn't play tonight. Um, so there's there's some weird stuff with that injury. They're really easing him back. They're saying we've got this precious this precious jewel, and we're just gonna we're not gonna mess up here. We're gonna just who knows that better than us? Absolutely. Am I right? So you you brought up a good point. Let's let's talk about the rookies really quickly here. Um, I've got both of their averages in front of me. So right now, Franz Wagner second on the team in scoring, thirteen point nine points points per game. He's shooting forty nine percent from the floor, forty three percent from the three point line, while adding three point six rebounds, one point nine assists, averaging just one turnover, one steal, and zero point six blocks per game. And Jalen Suggs, on the other hand, uh, you know, I think this is a good place to start. Uh, 12.7 points per game, promising. Uh, but on 12.9 field goal attempts a game, he's shooting 30% from the floor, shooting 25% from three. Yeah. Uh, 4.1 free throw attempts per game, he's shooting 86% from the three point line, or excuse me, from the free throw line. Uh, 2.7 rebounds, uh, defensive rebounds, 3.6 rebounds total. Four assists, 3.3 turnovers, like you mentioned. That's really the area that he needs to work on. Uh, 1.1 steals per game, uh, which is leading the team right now. Uh, really, Franz, Jalen, only guys averaging um, you know a steal or more per game, so that's good to see. With Jalen, Luke, what was more concerning for me was that he was getting to the rim and just wasn't really finishing yeah. at a high level. And we saw this out of Cole last year, and especially after the trade deadline, Cole like got much better as a finisher at the rim, obviously with more opportunities. I feel like we're seeing that out of Jalen. He had a couple of really nice finishes. The 86% from the free throw line and the shooting form is why I'm not concerned about him as a shooter. He's a guy that seems like has legitimate range. I don't want to say it's like Trey Young right. or like Dame or like Steph Curry, but it's like somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Like he's definitely got some decent range beyond, beyond just right behind the line. So, um, but we're seeing like defensively, he's looked great, like against some really good guys, like, you know, guarding Fred Van Vliet, like, you know, obviously doing his best friend, Fred Van Vliet, one of the better guards in the league. Um, you know, but we've seen him on like Evan Fournier he played really good against him in that second, uh, Knicks game. And he just has a knack for the ball at like getting deflections and just being a pest. You can tell that he's really annoying, um, you know, to play against. Uh, and then the passes, man, like he makes like one or two like very special passes advanced level passes each game and it's going to take time obviously we've had to be very patient with him but I am so confident that when it clicks for him it's just going to be night and day and we're going to see a totally different player we're going to see the player that we envisioned when we drafted him yeah yeah for sure and I think I mean man you you look at the the team right now and kind of the the way that you know Cole shooting the ball, Franz is shooting the ball, Mo, like these guys right now are 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 shooting the crap out of the ball, quite frankly. And um and they're doing it at a high clip. I mean, Cole shooting, you know, six point four a game, Franz four point six a game. 
I mean, if Franz can shoot 39%, right now he's shooting 43.8. If he can shoot 39%, even from just four attempts a game, not 4.6 where he's at right now, I'll, I won't be mad at that at all. But, but yeah, I mean, as far as Jalen Suggs goes, it's um, he he's able to contribute in a lot of ways. But it I, it really is kind of his decision making, and in some instances that does frustrate me a little bit. Um, I've talked to you guys about it before, but like, um, you know, in the pick and roll, it just seems like he doesn't know what his next move is, what's gonna come come next. He's not. It, it just seems like him reading the pick and roll isn't incredible. But then he'll have some times where he's the pick and roll ball handler and look great. So it really is just kind of a balance. He's trying to figure it out. Um, it's a frustrating process. We knew that this year would be frustrating a lot of ways, but still be fun. I mean, you've got these guys, like I said, shooting at that high of a clip um, for you know Franz and and Cole and Mo and seeing and and seeing Mo Wagner get kind of those like last night him and Franz going back and forth trading three. Like it is a lot of fun. This team is a lot of fun. They're got, frustrating. They're incredibly fun. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what you're going to get out of a team that's, you know, one and six to this point. But um, but yeah, I, I Suggs is going to be a I think Suggs people are frustrated because people thought Suggs was NBA ready. And to an extent, he he is, but also he's got a lot to work through. Um Franz is just more NBA ready at this point. Franz has been the best rookie. Franz is going to make his way into rookie of the year conversations and then not be laughed at um, in terms of maybe like saying like the statement of Franz. I've seen it thrown around by non-Magic fans. Franz is, you know, you could consider Franz Wagner um, even a top three right now rookie in the league. And it is. And, and that should be very encouraging for Magic fans. That like while we're waiting on the development of Jalen Suggs, Franz is kind of the immediate gift that we get and uh, get to see him play every night, too. And it's just like there's never a time on the court except for, you know, Mosley's guys that he threw out there at the end of the third the other night um, that aren't just kind of a – there's at least not at least one or two guys that are just like a joy to watch because you you don't know what's going to happen and you're just like enthralled and enthused when something happens, you know, that they produce something. Yeah, with Franz, like, you know, we were defending him throughout preseason and, you know, summer league – that he was in the right spots a lot of times, and it seemed like you know he knew what he was doing defensively, and you know was making some good cuts. But I have to say, I've been so pleasantly surprised with just how quickly yeah. Franz's offensive game has come around. Like obviously the forty three percent from three point line, like that's huge. If he's able to sustain that, he's going to be an elite shooter in the league. But the things that he's able to do, like just his passing vision, the plays that he makes, the things that he's able to do off the dribble and has the confidence already to do off of the dribble has been really encouraging. Yeah, We talked about like pre-draft when we were breaking down all the rookies that Franz, like a lot of times, was the primary ball handler and pick and roll. And we we're like, eh, you know what? He's probably not going to do that at the league, like in the league. Luke, I'm kind of second guessing that. Like some people were like two games in, they're like, oh my God, this is Hito Turkaloo. I'm like, okay, he's not Hito Turkaloo. Like, you know, he's got a little bit of that to him, but we're never going to see him as like a point forward. I'm not totally convinced now that that's the case. Like, we've seen him do some things off the dribble, especially against bigs, or, you know, if he gets, uh, like the other night, he had uh, LaMelo ball switched onto him. He just gave him a couple of bumps to the chest, went right past him, and was at the rim for a bucket. So, Franz has been really the big surprise for me. He's just been so great. Um, Cole has been playing really well. We're going to talk more about Cole specifically in a few minutes, so I don't want to get into that. Um, looking at the averages here, the last thing that I want to touch on, so we have Mo Bamba at 13.1 points per game, Wendell at 12.6 points. Um, Mo is shooting 53% from the floor. Wendell is shooting 51% from the floor. Mo Bamba is shooting 44% uh, from the floor uh, from the three-point line. Wendell is shooting 34% from the three-point line. Uh, Mo is averaging nine rebounds. Wendell is averaging nine point three rebounds. Mo is averaging one point nine blocks per game. Wendell is averaging one point per game. Luke, we talked all off season, all summer league, all preseason, even I think the first handful of regular season games, that Wendell is just by far and away the better player right now. He's the more consistent player right now. I feel like my mind about that is changing a little bit. I'm not ready to say that Mo Bamba is the better player, Luke but I feel like it is much closer than we thought coming into the season. How do you feel? Yeah, man. I, I for one, 
feel like a goober because I feel like a goober <laughs> because <laughs> I feel like a goober because all off season it was like Mo or WCJ I'm dying Mo or WCJ and then have you ever seen the meme of the girl the the little girl and she's like why not both that is literally WCJ and Mo Bamba why not both they they can play together man they can play together they both are averaging nine rebounds a game right now they're both averaging about the same amount of points per game I think like they're guys that could share the court or they could be on the court without the other I mean they don't need each other and then but they complement each other it is such a weird thing because we just didn't think about it like that wasn't even a, a possibility in our minds that they could play together and Mo Mosley, I will say that is the one thing Mosley has done. You know, and 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 I think that even the front office has probably come along on the idea more than they were in the preseason, right? I mean, they had that pod squad episode, and and he was talking about, you know, what do you think about Mo and WCJ? And he was like, well, let's be clear, when Jonathan Isaac comes in, he's the four, which is right. But in the moment, it felt right. like he was. Just, still, it yeah. felt it felt like he was rubbing off the idea of Mo and WCJ playing playing together in general, on the court at the same time, besides right now. Like, it's, all, it's just a silly little thing Moses is doing right now. I don't know, you know? But but it really is something that could work for this team. Like, something you could see where if you're, you know, if you've got J.I. off the court, you bring WCJ in the game off the bench to stagger some minutes where he's on the court with Mo. And just knowing that WCJ can play the four, I mean, it, it really is. I mean, I... I think that it's close, right? But I think that it's very different now. I don't think that this needs to happen anymore. Like, I don't think your question has to be asked anymore. Like, who's better, WC? I, I don't care. <laughs> I don't right. care. I think that they can coexist on the same roster and be good and complement each other. It doesn't have to be one against the other anymore. Like, they, they are very much on the same wavelength. I, I'm... I I think I'm I'm past the the debate. I just don't know if there is one anymore. I need. Do you remember? I think it was after the last preseason game where we did that live, and we had a, a gentleman come on to the live and ask whether or not we thought <laughs> like we would see Mo Bamba and Wendell Carter Jr. together in the regular season, and we basically like laughed. We were we, like, no, we like, laughed him off. Yeah, this is a cool thing that they they tried, but like we're we're not gonna see this and. I need to issue an apology because <laughs> yeah. they have been really great. Like they, they both have been really great. And I do not envy Jamal Mosley when Jonathan Isaac comes back and he has to make the decision of who does he start Mo Bomber or Wendell Carter jr. I said that I think at the beginning of the week in one of like my post game recaps. And I, even in the moment I was like, Hmm, is it a little bit early to say this? I was like, you know what? I'm just going to say it because I think Mo has been really good. Mm. And like, I felt that Mo Bamba, was like the you know inferior rebounder compared to Wendell, and I do still feel like that to a certain extent. But when you look at the rebounds, and it's nine point three, and Mo is averaging nine a game. I really felt like Mo was averaging like six or seven rebounds a game. The fact that he's averaging nine now, the eighteen rebound game obviously inflates this a bit, but Mo has legitimately been very good. I will argue with anybody, and I still see people saying things on Twitter like, "Oh, Mo Bamba is not playing well." It's like he had twelve points and. 10 rebounds in the first half. What do you want him to do? Yeah, if he... Like, if, and two if, blocks. Yeah. What and, else can you ask from the kid? And I saw that thread, too, and the guy basically went on to say, like, yeah, he had a great first half, but I'd like to see it all the time. You, He had a great... He's doing it all the time now. But but it, but that's the thing, though. Like, like people say that, right? They're like, oh, but I want to see it the whole length of the game. Why does that matter when, he, when last year you would have paid... Thirty dollars to see a Mo Bamba, can, you know, Mo Bamba average these type of numbers, right? Like, and you would have argued, you know, to your blue in the face that Mo should get these minutes, or maybe you were just a Mo hater and you said, and and by the way, if you were a Mo hater and you were like, you know, whatever, and I, I I'm I'm guilty of this too. I said this in the preseason. I said you can move on from Mo. I wouldn't be hurt about it. Like you can. Move I on. said. I said you don't feel like that's too early. You're like no. No, I didn't. And I truthfully, I didn't. I wouldn't like say that differently, you know, anyway today. Um, at the time, that's just the truth. He has gone to just prove us wrong, like prove me wrong. I, I knew. It. Now, I will say this. There's a caveat, right? It's been seven games. I want him to stay healthy. I want him to continue to contribute. However, I think that he has every right to be the starting center on this team. 
I, I, I will not bat. So does Wendell, though. No, absolutely. I won't. I know what I was about to say. My next follow up was like, it sucks now. Yeah. I'm well, upset about this. Well, right. But it's better than them, both of them being absolute trash cans. So there's that. You're right about that. Yeah. So you ain't lying. So it makes it, I'm not going to bat an eye. And this is what I was about to say. If Moe's starts WCJ over Mo or Mo, but because I think they're going to play the same amount of minutes. I, I think that, that right now, I mean, let's see. Right now, you got Mo playing 32, WCJ playing 27. So. Playing both twenty four minutes a game, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't see you know a, a problem with with that at all. Like I said, I really, even though when Ji comes back, it looks a little trickier. But I really, I really think and hope that WCJ versus Mo is just kind of dead at this point because I really do think that they both contribute in very you know beneficial ways. I'm a fan of both of those guys. I'm not, I'm not like as long as you can stay healthy. You know, Wend- Wendell Carter Jr.'s had his stuff, you know, his injuries. Moe's had his stuff. I did want to say this, Jonathan, about Mo. And before we move on to Cole, I'm proud that Mo is only averaging two and a half fouls a game right now. This was a guy when he was battling with his conditioning stuff after being with COVID and everything, you saw him just pile on the fouls. He, at this point, like I said, he's aver- he's not even leading the team in fouls right now, which is great. He's not even second. WCJ is second. He's fourth behind Cole Anthony at 2.6. So the fact that like his conditioning's back, like Mo Bamba is back, right? I mean, he he's back. Mo to, Bamba is not back. Mo Bamba has finally arrived. <laughs> yeah. Well, Mo Bamba is back to being in the forefront of people's minds, I should say, in terms of. And let's let me. I just roster. need to say this. Mo Bamba was infinitely better than Ken Birch mm. that Friday game against Toronto. Yeah, but also Kim Birch should start back over. To that stat Kim, line. Kim Birch should start over Precious Achua, though. By six the way, six points, six rebounds in twenty-three minutes, one of three from the floor. That's a whole other discussion. We're not going to get into Toronto logistics. <laughs> they can handle their own problems. But uh, Mo has looked very, very good, and um, the Magic are going to have a very potentially complicated decision to make this summer with Mo Bamba and, and Wendell Carter Jr. I'm hoping that they can coexist on the floor. And just kind of like keep their egos in check because having both of those guys on the team is going to be like a huge advantage for this team. Yeah, absolutely. All right, right, Luke, we've talked these guys up for the past, you know, 10, 15 minutes now. The most anybody on a one on six team has been talked up in their lives, by the way. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. So I want to talk about the problems with the Magic. What's wrong with this team? As good as they've played in in stints, um, the team is one and six. The team is not good right now. Just looking at the numbers, Luke, right now, they're 18th in the league in offensive rating, which if you would have told me that before the season started, I'd be like, okay, that's not bad. I'll take 18th. However, they are 30th in defensive rating. Yeah. They are 29th in net rating, and they are 29th in turnover percentage. So number of turnovers isn't always great because it's not adjusted for pace, how yeah. fast the team plays, how many possessions they have. Uh, but the turnover percentage is adjusted for pace. So they are 29th in the league in turnover. So it's obviously a problem. Uh, starting unit is second in the league right now in all lineups that have played more than 40 minutes together at 21.5. So per 100 possessions, that starting unit is outscoring teams by 21 and a half points, Luke. Um, part of this goes back to what we saw at Detroit Um you know, that game on Saturday, the issues that came from that, it is so painfully apparent to me. And I'm not saying anything that, like, this isn't a, you know, 150 IQ take or anything, but you need to have Cole Anthony or Jalen Suggs on the floor at all times. You need to have Wendell Carter or Mo Bamba on the floor at all times. As soon as we break the lineup, especially when, like, that lineup, there was no Cole, there's no Jalen, there's no Wendell. There's no Mo Bamba. And, you know, they just really, like, let go of the rope pretty much. So there are some glaring problems with the Magic right now. I don't think, I mean, you are what you are. And right now we don't have Markel. We don't have J.I. It's not totally fair to, um, like, really, you know, sell this team one way or the other right now. Because you don't have those guys. We know once those guys are back, this team is going to look very, very different. 
And it seems like until those guys get back, Luke, I just don't see a solution to the problem. Unless you're going to play, you know, Jalen, Cole, Mo, and Wendell, if you're going to play those guys, you know, 37, 38 minutes per game yeah. and make sure that one of those guys is on the floor at all times, this is going to continue to happen with the bench. Um, you don't have a real playmaker or ball handler in that second unit. R.J. Hampton, as as much as I love him and as much potential as I think he has, it is clear that he is not there yet, even no. in the second unit, to be the primary ball handler. Cool. Gary Harris isn't up to the task. It doesn't seem like Terrence Ross is up to the task to be, be the primary ball handler in the be, second unit. It's got to be Chuma, right? I mean, are, we're going to go through this, like, do we think like I don't think Chuma's up to the task? Well, no, to be but, the primary ball handler in the second unit, right? I mean, like, you, we, I don't think there's an answer on the roster right now, in like in that second unit. I don't think there's a move to to make. It yeah. seems like we're just waiting on Markel and Ji to get back. Yeah, I mean that's fair for sure. I mean, that, I mean, you look at Chuma the other night. You know, I mean, fourteen minutes, one assist, three turnovers. So like. Maybe he's we not. Cannot, I don't mean to cut you off. We cannot judge Chuma on one game. He hasn't played a game in almost six months. Right. Wasn't a full participant in training camp. Had no, you know, preseason. Like it's going to take him a couple of weeks to knock the rust off. If we're talking about Chuma struggling in a month, I'll be worried. Give him it two to three weeks at the least. Well, before no, you become critical of Chuma. not not a not a um, judging him for the fact of just him. I'm saying. Going back to him being a prim- primary ball handler, regardless of the situation, three turnovers, one assist, that's just a decision-making thing, and that's just that you either got it or you don't when it comes to that type of thing. Maybe that is all I need to kind of see, you know, obviously, like when, when Markel comes back, not going to happen, right? I mean, not at all. But um, but there's, I mean, last year, he averages 2.2 assists a game, nothing crazy, but only a point eight, you know, point eight turnovers. So I'm saying, and that since I'm the one that threw it out there, it is possible until they get back that you have Chuma. I RJ Hampton, I love the kid, and I'm a big fan of RJ Hampton, but if I have to see him handle the ball much longer, my computer's going through the window. I I can't do it. If you can stagger and get Chuma in there with the bench, like to get some type of thing going there on the you know from the bench, and have him run the offense just temporarily, I really don't know. But it, but at least try, try to let him run the offense because I've seen everybody else and I hate it all. <laughs> like and I just just keep trying things, throwing things at the wall until Markel gets back because, like you said, there just may not be an answer. I really don't know. I think you have to take a look at Franz as well, like getting Franz some more time with the second unit, kind of like we used to see with like Evan Fournier and Aaron Gordon. Yeah, you know, kind of stagger their minutes with the bench just to give them a little bit more of a you know offensive punch and just really like a guy that knows how to play basketball and like organizationally. And I do feel bad being critical of RJ because like again, I'm not giving up on RJ by any means, but right now, you know, with the options that we have in the second unit, there's just like there's no offensive flow. There are so many turnovers, uh, you know, in that second unit. You know, like it's just it's all bad, and it's literally it's the bench right now. Like that's the number one problem with this team is you know the lack of organization in that second unit. They can't score. They can't guard anybody. It's just you look at the the net rating of that starting unit, and it's just painfully apparent that all of the issues of this team right now, I would say 90% of the issues because starters are playing well, but they're not perfect. We've talked about that, but um, yeah, like you, you really just have to fix this bench. And I'm afraid that this is just going to turn into a waiting game. And yeah. it feels like we're just at the mercy of the front office because it seems like these guys might be ready, but they obviously are being very, very cautious with them and their health because they've invested so much into the future of those guys to be the future of this team. But if those guys are ready, I do feel like the front office owes it to the diehard fans of this team, not the casuals, <laughs> but the diehards, you know, that watched all 72 games, you know, last year when we were, you know, told that that was going to be a playoff team and they get off to that great start. And then you're just watching four months of the team just suck, mm-hmm. uh, you know, largely due to injuries, but it's, it is what it is. And, we tried the lottery last year. We saw how that can end up. 
And I think that we should be prioritizing guys learning how to win over just saying, oh, we'll just give them as many minutes as possible. And, you know, we'll, like you said, we'll just throw stuff against the wall and kind of see what sticks. Yeah. Uh, I'm afraid that we're just kind of stuck waiting uh, for those guys to get back. Unfortunately, I, I'm I'm really concerned that there's not an answer outside of you know Markel Fultz coming back, and then Mosley's going to have a lot of tough decisions here with Mo and Wendell, but then also Cole Anthony, who we're going to talk about in just a second here. You know Jalen Suggs. I I don't envy the decisions that um, Mosley has to make rotation wise. You know in the next two to three months here. All right, Luke, let's talk about Cole Anthony because Cole Anthony has, you know, maybe outside of Mo Bamba, has improved more than any of the returning players of the Orlando Magic this year. So I'm just going to give you some numbers for Cole Anthony right now. Uh, right now he's leading the team 17.7 points per game, shooting 44% from the floor, 42% from the three-point line, 81% from the charity stripe, adding 7.4 rebounds, 5.3 assists, 2.6 turnovers, 0.7 steals per game. Uh, just looking at his net rating, uh, 3.5, uh, so positive. You know, Obviously, he's part of that starting unit that is playing so well. Um, 114.4 offensive rating with Cole Anthony on the floor, 110 uh, defensive rating. One thing that I can say about Cole is he talked about being an improved defender this year. I have not seen any evidence of that so far. He's been getting torched. Uh, but right now, he is third in scoring for all second-year players, Luke. He is fifth in assists for all second-year players. He's fifth in rebounds for guards in the entire league. Uh, right now, he has a 55.2 effective field goal percentage, which is 87th percentile in the league. Uh, in the short mid-range, which I believe is like 3 to 10 feet, shooting 55%, which is 90th percentile in the entire league. Non-corner threes, 46%, 91st percentile, and then all three-pointers, you know, sitting there at, um, this is cleaning the glass, so it's, their stats a little bit, um, you know, contradicting what NBA has, NBA.com, but it says all three, 44%, which is the 92 percentile in the league, and uh, those advanced metrics are per cleaning the glass. Yeah. So, Luke, I went as deep as I could into these numbers. Cole Anthony is just shooting the crap out of the basketball right yeah, now. I don't, I don't know I, how any other way to say it. I don't it. need the numbers to know that. That like yeah. he's he's just I mean, he is playing very well, obviously, which has uh, been a great pro to this season so far of what has been a weird season even to start. But, you know, you you look at these numbers, man. I mean, you he's playing like roughly he played twenty seven minutes a game last year and forty seven games. Through seven, he's playing 33 minutes. We expect that to probably take, you know, a a little bit of a tick down once Markel comes back. Maybe he goes down to that, maybe that 31, 30 number. I just hope it doesn't go much lower than that. He's just been sensational. I think that he deserves all the playing time in the world. You go to his per 36 numbers, and, you know, this is where you can kind of pull what you need, right? The his per 36 numbers last year was like 17 points a game. Um, 0.8 0.8 steals, 5.4 assists, 6.2 rebounds, um, 39 and a half basically from the field, 33.7% from three. This year, the biggest things there's only a two point differential in his points per game because he's always been a like he's always been a, a, a chucker, if you will. Um, he's going to get his shots up. So last year, especially, it's just the way that the the efficiency in which he is doing that, right? Um, his per 36, obviously his three point percentage and everything like that shooting, you know, he'd be shooting seven attempts a game and last year 4.9, but shooting 42% as opposed to 33%. Um, also his rebounds, right? I mean, you're looking at his per 36 is increased by two rebounds a game. Um, I mean, he's just the, the, the biggest things for me is just his efficiency and his rebounding. Like you said, he's what fifth amongst all guards in the NBA. Like you were listing second year stats and just outright in the NBA, he is fifth amongst guards. If if he can keep that up, that'll be impressive. I, again, I think he'll see a slight minute um, decrease here coming up soon. But I I also think that you know his rebounding and his efficiency man has made me. I just give me all the Markel. I mean the the Cole Anthony stock. Give it all to me. He's been incredible. 
Yeah, like, uh, you know, going back to, like, the advanced metrics. So, like, last year, his effective field goal percentage was 46.5, which was the 19th percentile in the league. So, basically, what that means is 81% um, of players in the league had a better effective field goal percentage than Cole Anthony. So, we've seen a huge jump there. Um, you know, the the short mid-range, you know, jumpers, which he's taking, you know, a, a quite a few of this year. Uh, he was 33% last year. This year, so far, 55%. And you mentioned, you know, 33% from three last year, 42% so far. Like, that's a massive jump. So, with me, as much as I love what we're seeing out of Cole Anthony, it's only been seven games, and part of me is, like, waiting for the other shoe to drop. Like, okay, he's shooting the ball so well. And the next night, okay, shooting the ball so well, shooting the <laughs> ball so well. Last year, like, the issue with Cole was just, like, his consistency. Yeah. Like, we would see games like this where, you know, three of five from three and 20-plus right. points or whatever. So I just want to, like, wait a little bit longer. Like, if this is, like, a 20-game sample size and he's doing this, I'm going to be like, okay, this is, like, he's just having an incredible season. Right now, like, I'm just like, uh, I don't know if this is for real yet. Too good to be true be. type scenario. Almost, yeah, because if Cole has made this kind of a jump, like, that really, really changes things. Like, then, like, the Markel, Jalen Suggs, Cole Anthony thing gets, like, really, really interesting. Yeah. Then I think you do have like a legitimate like all right who is the odd man out at this point because I don't always feel like that right now I'd say the odd man out right now is R J Hampton yeah. you're looking at the guards that we have and we're not talking about the veterans Gary Harris and you know Terrence Ross we know that neither of those guys will probably be on this team past next year and that's if you don't trade Terrence Ross you know or both of them this year Gary Harris will not be back next year if I had to guess regardless if he's on the team the rest of the season. Um, but I, I'm just it, it feels too good to be true. I'm not saying that from a perspective of he can't do it or he's not capable, but I was just not expecting this. And if that's the case, like it's just another step forward and like the rebuild that's like, wait a minute, this might not take as long as we thought. Yeah. Yeah. He's been But he's just shooting the crap out of the ball. And you're hundred percent right. You didn't need any of these numbers to know that. No. You just have to watch the games. Right. And you don't have to look at the box score. It's yeah. just like, oh, he made another one. Oh, not, he made another one. Yeah, and, and not to mention, I think that he does a, a good job of of running the offense right now. I mean, he he's he's not great, but he's good, right? And I and I think that you know, obviously, his shooting is a big reason for it. But you know, five five point three assists per game right now, two point five turnovers. Uh, I I think that there's you know that obviously he's going to be able to run you know, be the primary ball handler when, you know, Markel comes back and, and they have to, you know, Markel goes out, Cole's in. I think you're going to have to run one of them at primary um, because otherwise you're just back to where you are right now where, like, you have a unit that just doesn't have a primary ball handler and I just want to gouge my eyes out, so. Yeah. The last thing that I'll say about Cole, and I don't have any data right now to back this up, uh, I think we need, like, a bigger sample size and I'm still trying to find where I could find this type of data. But it just feels like right now when we run pick and roll and a big gets switched on a Cole, like he's he's pulling out the handkerchief, tying it around his neck, bringing out the knife and the fork, and he's like, I'm just about to feast on this guy because it's just like over and over like we saw it in the preseason. I know it was like Enos Cantor. Um, you know, we saw it last night. Um, Isaiah Stewart, he had a really nice uh, step back. I know we've seen it in multiple games this year, like Cole just getting switched and either just like putting the dribble moves on, step back three, or just like getting to the rim like really, yeah. really easily against these guys. So he just is really putting it together right now. It's been really exciting to watch Cole, um, and I, I really hope it, it continues, to be honest, because it would be huge for the Magic. Luke, let's talk the week ahead. We talked about last week. Let's forget about it. Winless week, terrible. Um, so tonight, November 1st, we'll be at Minnesota. That game starts at 8 o'clock Eastern time on Valley Sports Florida. Then Wednesday, November 3rd, we will be home for Boston. Uh, that game starts at 7 o'clock. Then Friday, November 5th, versus San Antonio. That game starts at 7 o'clock. We'll also be at home. This is like the third time that we're playing each San Antonio and Boston. If you include like preseason and the regular season now, I'm sick of seeing these teams. And then Sunday, I will be at home versus the Utah Jazz. That game will start at 6 o'clock. Uh, Eastern. Uh, the good thing about uh, the Utah Jazz game, that will be their second game of a back-to-back. -back. They'll be in Miami the night before, so Saturday night. So maybe that's like a triple overtime game against the Miami Heat. We'll get a very tired Utah Jazz and uh, hopefully pull out a W, Luke. Um, what do you think happens this week? Give me your prediction. What's the Magic's record? 
Uh, I, I don't think that they can get the win in Minnesota. And Minnesota just looks, you know, pretty good right now. It's at Minnesota. I just don't see it happening. Boston is just a toss up for me. I mean, they're two and four. It's been really weird. It's just like has is the removal of Brad Stevens at the helm of, you know, being the head coach. Has it been that big of a difference for him? I, I don't know, but um, they're two and four so far. So I, I really don't know. You play the Spurs again. I would love to redeem ourselves from that just embarrassing blowout to start the year against a subpar San Antonio team. Um, I think it would be a good gauge, right? Um, you have a day's rest on Thursday. I think it'd be a great gauge to kind of see where we're at. Um, and then you got the Jazz. I think that, uh, I think Jonathan, I think, I think I'm going to say we're going to go two and two this week. Sound the alarms. Ooh. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm definitely not ready to say that. Uh, so yeah, Minnesota has put some wins together to start the season. Look, this is the game that I'm, I'm just spoiler. This is the pick the game that I'm picking the magic to win yep. two really tough losses. The last two games, I think this team is going to bounce back. Jalen Suggs, this is going to be his, you know, basically his homecoming. Um, you know, he's from Minnesota. This is going to be his first game there as a, you know, a Orlando Magic player and an NBA player. So their wins so far this year um, at home versus Houston and New Orleans. Both of those teams are terrible. Then they lost to New Orleans. They beat Milwaukee. And then on Saturday, so last night, um, they just barely lost to Denver. Will Barton had like a crazy uh, game-saving block at the buzzer. So this is the game that I think the Magic have to win. Really, you know, two tough losses back to back. You just you zero and four. You're in a you know four game losing streak right now. The team really really needs a win. I think they're going to want to get it for Jalen. You know, being at home, I expect him to play well. I think he's just going to continue to improve here. Um, that's the game for me that I'm going to pick the Magic to win. Um, you know, Boston. It just feels like every time we play those guys. Jalen Brown, you know, Jason Tatum, they'll find a way to win. Um, you know, San Antonio, they just blew the brakes off of us a couple of weeks ago, so I'm not excited for that game. And then Utah, you know, one of the best teams in the Western Conference. So um, <laughs> I love your enthusiasm, uh, but I have us going one and three on the week. I really think we need to pick up that win, um, you know, against Minnesota. But um, I'm not feeling very confident going into any of these games um, just with the way that the bench, you know, uh, is currently playing. So, yeah, uh, Luke, I think that's going to do it for us this week. This is one of our longer episodes in a while. You know, four games in a week is going to do that. We had a lot to talk about, a lot of good, a lot of not so good. Um, do you have anything else before we go ahead and sign out here? I just want to clarify for the record when it does happen. Uh, I've got the Magic beating the Celtics and the Spurs, so we're sandwiching the wins. Not the Jazz. Been... Okay, excuse me. I heard that incorrectly. Yeah, I'm, I'm putting some 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 losses Around those two, I'm going, uh, yeah, Celtics and uh, Celtics and Spurs for the Magic going two and two on the week. First win streak of the year, Luke. I like it. Yep. Let's let's make that happen. That would make me feel much better. Um, hopefully, we have a, a much more upbeat podcast uh, next week. But um, great job, man. All right, guys, that's going to do it uh, for Luke Sylvia. This has been Jonathan Osborne. You guys are listening to the Six Man Show, and we will catch you guys next time. See ya. Thanks for listening to The Six Man Show. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, and Stitcher to get new episodes downloaded directly to your phone. Please take a minute to give us a five-star rating and a review. It would really help us out a lot. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Six Man Show and like us on Facebook. We'll catch you guys next time. Go Magic!